Father who's an individual, God the Son who's an individual, God the Holy Spirit who's an individual. Each is fully God, but one is not the other. Each has their own separate center of consciousness. Each has their own mind. He said uh, two weeks ago, October 7th, I think it was, that I assume that they only have one center of consciousness and there's only one center of consciousness in God, which means he holds to more than one center of consciousness in God. And you're going to tell me you've got one God still? Absolutely not. It is conceptual tritheism. Now, um, ladies and gentlemen, of course, my, I, don't, I don't have the time here, but I, I will deal with Philippians 2 in the cross-examination. I feel like it's going to come up. But uh, he says, um, I'll, I'll just tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, on page 171 of his book, Mr. White says, The Father is not the Son, nor is the Son the Holy Spirit. Each are fully and completely God so God the Father is not God the Son, who is not God the Holy Spirit. Each are fully God. Each are divine individuals. None of the 23,145 verses of the Old Testament know this. God's Old Testament covenant people never knew one thing about a three-minded God. When we put my opponent's statements together, we're told that God the Father is one separate individual, who is not God the Son, who is one sep another separate individual, who is not God the Holy Spirit, who is another separate individual. Apparently, each divine individual individual can communicate with each other as human beings. None of God's people knew about this for 7,000 years. Then when we turn to the New Testament, we have the testimony of the New Testament writers that just says Jesus is this same one God we've been reading about the whole time manifest in the flesh. That is who Jesus is. He is God manifest in the flesh, not a second of three divine persons that no one knew existed. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've now heard the substantive arguments from the affirmative and the negative, and our two speakers have had a chance to formally defend their position and attack one another in the relative safety of the wooden podium in the front. I think you'll understand and feel that at this point, it's important for us to get our, our speakers talking to one another. We seem to have come to a point in the debate where the affirmative is arguing that truth can be discovered by a close um, exegesis of the New Testament with knowledge of New Testament grammar and lexicon. The negative team is arguing that the truth can be found in 4,000 years of Hebrew um, revelation and all of those personal pronouns. Both teams have said these two positions very clearly and now we know where they both stand. This is where it gets interesting. We are about to enter two rounds of cross-examination. In the first round, each speaker will have 15 minutes. In the second round, each speaker will have 10 minutes. And here's how it will work. Um, firstly, our affirmative, Dr. White, will be cross-examining uh, our negative speaker. And the purpose of cross-examination is to present questions and challenges relating to specific points that have been raised already. Neither speaker can introduce new arguments. And here's how the, the uh, cross-examination round works. The cross-examiner has 30 seconds and must form a question. If in that 30 seconds the speaker doesn't form a question, I will intervene and ask them to form a question. The respondent then has two minutes to answer the question. And uh, gentlemen, it must be about points that are already raised and it must be a question and answer format. So the two gentlemen are gonna stay seated with their microphones on and for the first 15 minutes, Dr. White will be addressing cross-examination questions to Mr. Perkins. Dr. White, you may begin. 15. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Perkins, could you please tell us who is performing the actions of the verbs uh, Hegesata and Ekenosin in Philippians 2, 6 through 7, and when they were performed. Gladly. Um, Philippians 2, 5 through 9, have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, the name of the historical Messiah, who, the, the referring back to Christ Jesus, although he, who, the Christ Jesus, existed, which is a present active participle, in the form of God, nothing there about second individual, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Who is that referring back to is the Messiah, sir, based upon 
the words Christ Jesus, which Paul used everywhere. It's always referring to the historical Messiah that walked this earth. Um, I asked for two verbs, uh, hegesata in verse 6 and akenosin in verse 7. The term means to empty, literally. Um, could you please tell, tell me, are you saying that the historical Messiah did not consider the equality he had with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself? Could you explain when this happened, please? Well, I just answered that, but I'll do it again. It was the historical Messiah who walked this earth, though he was in the form of God. He did not, as a NASB footnote says here, he laid aside his divine privileges. He did not retain and rightfully grasp a hold of his divine prerogatives as being in the form of God. The word morphe in form is defined by lexicographers as a human figure, as a body, as the external visage, Thayer. So I would say that you would be the one that would have the problem there. I'm still not getting an answer. Uh, when, the answer did the want, action, when did the action of Kenao in verse 7 take place? If you're saying it's during the human ministry, when during the human ministry of Jesus? As a man, I don't think you can nail down and say exactly what millisecond did he actually do this. This is describing the incarnation, God walking this earth as a man. I mean, I, if you want to millisecond i can't give you the exact millisecond when, when this that's describing the human life of jesus christ so you just said it's describing the incarnation which is what i said but i thought you just said this is actually describing jesus's human ministry well i, I don't think you can divorce the incarnation from his human ministry what is the incarnation but god becoming flesh oh well you're asking the question what <laughs> could you please explain to us how jesus the messiah was equal to God if he was God. Ta'ainai isatheo. What does it mean to be equal with God? Because this is, this is what he does not consider something to be held on to. How was the human Jesus equal with God? Because he was God in his human existence. He was God in flesh. Okay. Jesus. So how would this be an example then of humility? You're, are, are you saying that God did not give consideration to being equal with God? Jesus is God in the flesh, sir. I, I, though you're asking the question, I do not understand what kind of a thing it would be for Paul to tell us to imitate something that God did in heaven. That makes absolutely no sense whatsoever for Paul to say, well, now you need to do what God did in heaven. Makes no sense. But what does make sense is when he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God. That's how it's an extra uh, uh, exhortation to, to humility. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, and he is our example as God in the flesh, but not as a second divine person in the Trinity. Well, I know that's your position, but I haven't gotten an answer yet for what it means for the text to say that he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. What does that, how is that related to his humility if he did not lay that aside? In the first place, you're getting an answer. You're just not, just not getting the answer that you want, but it's still an answer. The answer is, again, God, is, Jesus is God in the flesh. Paul is not telling us to imitate something that God did in heaven prior to in eternity. What kind of thing would that be? But he's telling us to imitate the Messiah who was our example. So that's the answer. Could you explain the use of the reflexive pronoun at the beginning of verse 6?